I don't send anything to anybody. I write songs every day. I write songs that I feel like I'm compelled to write. I don't plan what I'm gonna write, I just write it. And I don't shop music. So meaning, I don't audition my songs. If I'm in a studio with Gucci, me and Gucci sitting around vibing, I might say, oh, I did this record a few months ago, check it out. And it'll be missing my woe and he'll cut it. You know, um, if I'm in a so studio with Trey songs, I'll say, okay, I did this song, check it out. So I don't, um, whore my songs out, you know what I mean? And when I say that, I don't mean, what I mean is, I'm not gonna do a bunch of records and send them out to everybody and have everybody have access to me. That's how you, how do you say exclusive that way? Yeah. So um, a lot of people are so thirsty that they kinda, I'm patient, I'll sit on a song for two, three years until I get the right person who I feel like she's singing and then play it for them. Speaking of the right person, who is someone that you've been in the studio with that you wrote a song and they just delivered on it the way that you thought that they would or way you saw people. it? Beyonce, Usher, Brandy, Monica, uh, Mario, several like Gucci Man, French Montana, like a lot of a lot. So many artists are just really professional and know how to translate what you say in in, in addiction. A lot of times uh, they do it different, but then they end up working because, for instance, um, "Ain't Worrying About Nothing" from French Montana was not. He even got the lyrics wrong. You know what I mean? Like so, but it worked. So sometimes. People giving their own take kind of makes it work better. But um, there's so many artists who now, now it's a lot of artists who don't do it as well. Or it's some artists I hear and I cringe because I'm like, it's just sounds terrible. It's not like what I, I ex yeah. and it end up being a hit, you know? So um, a lot of times, you know, you hit and you're missing, you, you know, you just keep working and grinding. So for all the ladies at my office, um, we, we you briefly gri gri um, grazed over this. What is it like working with Beyonce? How was it? What was the experience and what songs did you do? Uh, one of the nicest people you ever want to meet. Um, I, I've worked with people who don't have a fraction of her success. I'm like, if Beyonce is this room, I've worked with people who are this big, right? And they're rude and they're late, and they're not respectful. And Beyonce, for her to be as big as she is as an artist and as a personality and as a character and as a talent, as a talent, she's one of the nicest people I've ever met in the business, hands down. Shrewd businesswoman, but one of the nicest individuals um, you would ever want to meet. What songs did you guys do? Um, I did Sweet Dreams, Scared the Lonely, Save the Hero, and Radio. You did Radio? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, speaking of, where mm -hmm. did, um, so on all your tracks, you say, turn the lights on. Mm -hmm. I heard Beyonce say, turn the lights on in the... Um, Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. How did that come about? Because before it'd just be you uh, saying I it or something like that. I used to always right? say it, and then um, after we cut Sweet Dreams, she was about to leave, and she said, "Oh, I forgot to do the turn the lights on part." And she went in and she did it, and then she said, um, "After she, I overheard her accent, Max Goose, she said, what's turn the lights on?'" And she and he said, "That's something Rico always says." And she looked at her engineer. She said, "Take it out." All right. So I'm like, "Oh, damn." <laughs> and Beyonce shut my shit down. <laughs> so then later, the song got leaked, and it was called Beautiful Nightmare. When I wrote the song, it was called Beautiful Nightmare. It got leaked, and they had a huge investigation, and they thought, they thought it was, I'm like, there's no way it could have been me, because I didn't have access to her vocals. But um, they found out who did it, and a year later, when she was finishing the album, she said, um, I really want to keep that song, but it got leaked. And Max Goose said, why don't you keep it, but change the name to Sweet Dreams, and then the turn the lights on that you took out, the version got leaked without turning the lights on, but you put the version with turning the lights on in it. So it kind of like solidified me and my brand at that point. It gave you a major stamp. Yeah, it gave me a, the most incredible cosign ever. Then after that, other artists were like, I want to say turn the lights on instead of me say, because it usually just be my voice saying turn the lights on. I used to whisper it in the beginning. So a lot of songs, on There Goes My Baby, I'm just whispering it. Or on Motivation, I, I'm saying it really low. But um, when Usher did Daddy's Home, he was like, oh, let me go back in the booth. And he said, I just want to get your attention. Really want to be all up in your head. Turn the lights on. You know what yeah, I mean? So people, drive, yeah. people wanted to say it at that point. So it, was, it became like a thing where people were like, I want to do that. That's, that's, that's cool. You yeah. Know? I know that was major. So speaking of also major, in that same song, you in the background singing the vocals. Yeah, I sing all the backgrounds on On Beyonce's yeah. song. Yeah, if you listen closely, it's a male vocal. That's me singing all the vocals. <laughs> yeah. Beyonce is so big of an artist that whenever you sing backgrounds, you get a, a check called AFTRA. And Beyonce's, if you sing a background on Beyonce's song, an AFTRA check for you look like a royalty check. It's crazy. 
Like she, she, she's that massive of an artist. Nice, nice, nice. So speaking of artists, who, I want to transition to talking more about artists today and all that other stuff. Who was the artist that you used to listen to uh, growing up? Um, <clears throat> um, I listened to Billy Joel and uh, Elton John. I listened to Alice Cooper. I listened to Marvin Gaye, Michael Jackson. I listened to ACDC, Def Leppard, you know, um, Beatles. Um, my favorite album, one of my favorite albums of all time is uh, Abbey Road. Um, Rufus Wainwright, uh, Leonard, Leonard Cohen, Harry Nelson, um, Otis Redding, N.W.A. Yeah, like, you know, I'm, I was always just kind of like a fan of all types of different music and great writing, and great storytelling. Nas, Big. Big is my favorite rapper ever. Big? Yeah, yeah. Uh, What's your top three? MCs? Yeah. Um, Big Pac J. Big Pac J. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll go J. Big Pac. I just feel like it, it's all interchangeable. You know, they, they're three total different rappers. A yeah. lot of people don't understand that. So a lot of people try to compare them on like, who's the best. But it's like apples and oranges. I mean, people try to say, well, is Biggie better than, Jay, better than Pac? It's like they're two total different rappers. Yeah. Biggie was metaphor style. Jay, I mean, Pac was right in your face. Now, who you would want to compare is Pac. DMX because their styles are similar. DMX aggressive, wasn't yeah. a metaphor, not even aggressive. DMX didn't have metaphors. It was straight raw lyric to the point as where Pac was the same way. Big was clever, like clever. So lyrically, I say Biggie is the best lyrical rapper. As far as the biggest impact on rap culture ever is Tupac, hands down, without question. So the biggest rapper of all time is Tupac. And I feel like lyrically, a person who introduced us to a style and changed the way we rap and changed the flow and changed the way we our cadence and pocket, that you gotta give that to, to Biggie. So speaking of you um just talking about some of the previous artists, um so comparing artists from let's call them yesterday, right, to artists today, it feels like it's a it's such a rush um to put artists out for instant outcomes versus longevity of career. Why is that so? Um, it used to be about what what's great, and now it's about what what works, and the business has changed. Like, you got a situation where there's a funny story that I often tell. Erica Badu was sitting in the studio with a major executive who she was signed to, and she plays the executive this song, and she says, "Oh my God, this song is incredible. This should be your next single." And she said, it "Can't be." She said, "Why not?" It's from two albums ago. Hmm. It just shows you. But the person in charge of your music don't even listen to it. Yeah. Had no clue. Didn't live with it. Didn't didn't absorb it the way they should have. So that's what the game is now. I don't care what it is. As long as it works, I'm fine. As long as it sells. I don't like if the single works, then it's cool. I'm not listening to your album. I'm not a fan of you. At, the, at this point it's about work. When the LimeWire and Napster came out, people were so in a tough place to sell music that they felt like whatever works is what we're gonna get behind. They could love it. I, I was at Interscope. I put out an album called Turn the Lights On, and people from Interscope called me to this day and say, man, that album was incredible. And the albums that worked around that time weren't as good. Yeah. But, and they know that. But it worked, and that's what we're going for. So I think that's why the era is the way it is now, is because they're enabled by a, a, a system put in place to just capitalize off a quick fix as opposed to people who care about the culture and care about the substance and quality of music is more about where that works, so we can go with what works. You feel like that? I was, I'm, a, I'm more of a fan of a, of a, of an entire body of work, like a whole CD. Ver but I see everything as single driven now. Do you feel like that? It, it hurts the music industry for true artists who want to put out a full body. But it hurts artists. Out, yeah. it, it helps the business. The business is doing great. Like streaming is. You, you notice that art labels have not been complaining about money no more. Like yeah. Fast, they figured it out. They're making a shit ton of money. So, um, yeah, it hurts artists, it hurts real artists, but it's great for the business, I guess, financially. Terrible for the business in the long run, in my perspective, but that remains to be seen. So, um, about, so in social work and mental health, um, Eric Erickson and PAJ, they have these um, uh, theories on like early childhood development and just de uh, developmental theories, right? Um, that talks about things that happen at different stages, different ages, different ages, and everything like that. Talk about how you like to develop artists, and what are the stages for artist development that 
because I see it lacking now, but I know you are big on artist development. Talk about why that is and what stages and how do you work with preparing the artists? First of all, it has to be an extreme level of talent. So now we gotta start a conversation. What is your conversation? I'm gonna give you an example. Jeezy's tra conversation was trap, trap or die. Thug motivation. So everything that he put out on a thug motivation, um, it was like, get on your grind and get it. It was like he was inspiring people. So that was his conversation. Plies, real. Everything he talked about was real. I'm the real, I'm real, real, real. You know, um, uh, uh, Nas was a storyteller, so he always told these incredible stories of the streets of the struggle of the grind. Um, what is your conversation? Mary J. Blige was pain. It was hurt, it was heartbreak. So much so that even when she was happy, nobody he wanted, wanted to that hear. old Mary. They wanted that old Mary. They wanted that old Mary. That's the conversation. So first you have to figure out who you are as an artist and what your conversation is. Then you have to figure out what's the look. How's your hair gonna be? How's you gonna? You ever notice when an artist comes out on a, with a project, if the hair is gonna be long, it's got to be long throughout the whole project. You can't be have long hair this day today, and tomorrow you cut it off. They be like, "What you doing? You gotta put a wig on you. You got long hair. This is the long hair era." Now the next album, you wanna chop it, chop it. So it's different. Is the look, is the feel, is the aesthetic, is the conversation, and it's about consistently driving that point home to the people early and for them to know you and recognize you for this particular sound and this energy. So that's the development of stages, figuring out who you are, what your conversation is, what your look is, how people are gonna identify with you and relate to you. Gotcha. So do you feel like, <clears throat> before you used to have to be great, you have to come in and blow down uh, an A&R's office or something like that. I remember people used to go up to like L.A. Reid's office and all that other stuff. But now it almost seems like Greatness is almost not a requirement. Like no. social media allows people to build up this image that's not consistent with who they really are. Yeah. And they'll put books. If I want to seem smart, I'll put books inside of my room and I'll take a selfie or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'll say something I heard somebody else say that seem intelligent and the same knowledge. A beautiful knowledgeable. girl walks in the room. She's gorgeous. She can sing the house down. She can sing the pants off anybody, right? A and R hears her and thinks to himself, she's the best singer I've ever heard, and she's better than every singer I have on my entire label. Does he sign her? No. She don't got enough Instagram followers. Her SoundCloud ain't booming. It's not proven already. She don't already have a built-in fan base. So you have to ask yourself, what is your job as A and R? You don't have a job anymore. Your job is to say, Who's the fastest person to get this person who already built their brand up? Instead of saying, this person is talented, let me put the work in and build it up myself. No, that's not what we do. If you already booming, we want to fight for you. We'll do a bid in war and pay you top dollar to get you. And it's still a gamble, but it's more of a gamble, it's more or less of a gamble when you're already popping. Instead of saying, let me take this person who's not going to cost me that much because nobody knows him, and I can get him for a low number and help develop and spend the money on developing him. No, we don't want to do that no more. Sounds too much like, right, too much work. I don't want to work. I want you to work, and I want to capitalize off it. I want to throw a bag at you. And that's the game. The, what's, the, what's the theme of the conference this year again? Oh, the era of effort. The era of effort. Mm -hmm. So is that what your way of trying to correct that? You yeah, know what I'm saying? To let people know that. We can't sit around and say what's wrong with the game if we ain't trying to change it. And that's my, this is my uh, attempt to changing it. Gotcha. So what do you find as some of the pitfalls and, uh, and artists outside of just um, the lack of development. What do you see where artists go wrong in the industry? I know it's a multitude of things, but... There's so many things, but too much attention too soon could kill you. You start feeling like it's all you. You know, you start feeling like, well, I'm, I can do this myself. I don't need help. I'm good, you know? And then you realize how lonely of a road it is when you don't have anybody who, can, who genuinely cares about you and cares about your development. And when I say that, I mean, take a loss. See, I'm going to stand next to an artist I believe in after the loss. And the business is not designed for that. Trey Song's first three albums didn't do well. And then when Ready came out, boom, he blew up. So now all of the fans that he was able to, to gather became mega fans and he became a superstar, what it seemed like overnight. No, what happened was they kept believing him and pushing him. Nowadays, first album comes out, doesn't do well. You dropped or you shelved. And that's just the game. So... Um, the biggest pitfall I think artists make is believing I'm good. 